Well, hi everyone. Today I'm going to cover the results of the Coast Guard's final investigation into the Titan submersible tragedy that killed five people on June 18th, 2023. I'm going to go over the key points of uh, the report findings as well as tie this all together into a broader engineering context because there are root cause issues here that are important for engineers and engineering companies to be aware of and avoid falling into similar traps that led to this tragedy. So this Coast Guard press release indicates the Board of Investigation released their findings in their final report on August 5th 2025. I'm recording this video on August 15th, 2025. And there's links to this report and all the various references that I cite throughout this video in the description. This is footage from a remotely operated vehicle that was collected four days after the tragedy. Extreme violence associated with this implosion. The five occupants are said to have died instantaneously due to the immense pressures. You see debris strewn about the bottom of the Atlantic near the Titanic wreck site. This company, Ocean Gate, was operating essentially a tourism operation to take people down to view the Titanic wreck, and it was a, very much a commercial enterprise. So I want to go over this uh, summary that we put together here. The Marine Board of Investigation was unable to identify the exact failure of the Titan's hull but the evidence collected strongly indicates that the initiating event was the loss of structural integrity of the carbon fiber or the glue joint within the Titan cylindrical pressure hole. And the findings were that the probable failure point of the hole was either the adhesive joint between the forward dome and titanium segment or the carbon fiber hole near the forward end of the Titan. The design and testing process for Titan did not adequately address many of the fundamental engineering principles that would be crucial for ensuring safety and reliability in a hazardous environment. These inadequacies included the material selection and manufacturing processes, insufficient structural analysis and testing, insufficient identification and mitigation of risk factors, and insufficient process monitoring during manufacturing. Additionally, there was no analysis to understand the expected life cycle of the hull, and the analysis of the hull was based on assumed material properties with minimal manufacturing defects. So this photo was taken of the five occupants of the Titan submersible who would all be dead within two hours after this photo. You have Richard Stockton Rush III. He was the chief pilot slash chief executive officer. He was also the CEO of OceanGate. You have Paul Henry Nargale, content expert. Shazada Dawood is a passenger. OceanGate classified these folks as mission specialists to skirt regulatory issues to the extent that there were any. Suleiman Dawood, again passenger mission specialist number two, and Hamish Harding, and the final passenger mission specialist. Ranged in ages from 19 to 77. This of course is the geographic location of the Titanic wreck site. The Titanic sunk in 1912. The Titanic claimed over 1,500 lives. And of course we're talking about tremendous water pressures. The Titanic wreck site is in a water depth of over 12,500 feet, or roughly 4,000 meters, and the water pressure at that depth is 6,000 psi, or 375 atmospheres. So this is a picture of Stockton Rush, the head of OceanGate, and I'll show you the findings from the Marine Board of Investigation, but they were very damning relative to Mr. Rush. So Stockton Rush was 61 at the time of his death. Cause of death, of course, implosion of the Titan submersible. He was a degreed engineer and business person. Here's a view of the Titan. Initially it was called Cyclops II. It just shows the deployment here. Now some key details of that submersible. Displacement was 23,000 pounds. Length was 22 feet. The width was 9 feet. Height was 8 feet, and it was propelled by four electric thrusters controlled infamously by a game controller off the shelf. That was part of the uh, selling points, I guess, of this submersible is that it was c constructed using a lot of off the shelf parts. And the idea was that they could build several more of these submersibles in a very short period of time to greatly expand tourism opportunities to the deep ocean. I was looking for some type of executive summary 
and uh, there is one here, but it's rather lengthy. And then I realized the table of contents just list it right out in terms of what the key issues were. Inadequacy of structural engineering analysis. Lack of determination of identifying failure points of Titan's design. Failure to follow Boeing's manufacturing and testing specifications. So OceanGate enlisted the services of design companies, including Boeing, to provide guidance for the design and manufacture of the submersible. And according to the Coast Guard report, this advice was ignored in a wholesale fashion by Stockton Rush with Ocean Gate. Insufficient understanding of carbon fiber material properties for deep sea, use of an untested, uncertified acrylic window, flawed implementation and application of Titan's real-time monitoring system. So they had a monitoring system that monitored strains throughout the hole, but the real issue was if there was a problem, there really wasn't time to do anything about it. And in fact, there were previous warnings from earlier dives that various types of structural distress was going on with this carbon fiber hull, and the warnings weren't adequately addressed. And that refers to the detrimental effects of Titan's hull after a 2022 dive, circumvention of U.S. laws and international standards, weak regulatory framework for submersibles and operations, OceanGate's toxic safety culture. I'm going to go over that in more detail and just it goes on and on. So this is what I want to say about this engineering environment. Engineering needs visionaries. They need people who buck the trend as it were of conventional thinking. But those people need guide rails in terms of a regulatory framework and in terms of listening to the true engineering experts within their company or even outside the company giving them warnings and advice about how to handle uh, certain engineered products. But let's read from the Coast Guard report. OceanGate's operational safety practices were cr critically flawed, which contributed to the catastrophic implosion of the Titan submersible. At the core of these failures was a disconnect between the company's stated safety protocols and its actual practices. And it goes on that analysis reveals a disturbing pattern of misrepresentation and reckless disregard for safety in OceanGate's operation of the Titan submersible, with Mr. Rush seemingly using inflated numbers to bolster the perceived safety and dive count of the final Titan hull. OceanGate's cumulative dive count for the Titan was intentionally misleading by including the 49 dives of the scrapped original hull, they artificially inflated the operational experience of the final Titan hull, obscuring the fact that the final Titan hull had undergone a severely limited number of test dives, only 11, reaching a maximum depth of just 170 meters before being used for deep sea passenger voyages to the Titanic wreck at 3,840 meters. This deliberate manipulation of data created a false impression of the submersible's proven reliability and safety, and crucially, this misrepresentation provided an inflated sense of safety and security to mission specialists. So I'm going to touch on this aspect of the limited number of tests or successful dives and relate it to the Challenger tragedy. So I'll, I'll come back to that. So we'll continue on with the Coast Guard report's findings relative to the toxic work culture that they allege. Compounding these issues, the company's leadership structure concentrated virtually all decision-making power in the hands of its CEO, Mr. Rush. Although OceanGate had a board of directors, Mr. Rush's dominant behavior rendered it largely ineffective. The Marine Board of Investigation witnesses described board meetings as informational, with Mr. Rush showcasing accomplishments and dictating decisions. That's not a good engineering work environment whatsoever. And I'm just going to read this last piece relative to the toxic work culture. A prime example of Mr. Rush's disregard for opposing views from his senior staff was evident during the meetings with his director of operations on January 19, 2018, following an internal safety inspection of the first Titan hull conducted by the director of operations. After the director of operations made the point that OceanGate had hired him to take a conservative approach to safety, Mr. Rush made the following statement to the group assembled for the meeting. That's why we hired the director of operations, you know. It is for that level of detail and safety approach to it was the primary attraction to, to bringing the director of operations on board. And now we've gotten to the point where his experience and his estimation of the correct way to do it is fundamentally opposite of the approach that I want to take. And of course, this director of operations would later be fired 
by Mr. Rush, and this director of marine operations pointed out that there was no non-destructive testing of the carbon fiber hull to check for voids or delamination, which could compromise the hull's strength. He ended up filing a whistleblower complaint with OSHA, and essentially OSHA dropped the ball. They, they didn't follow through in a rigorous fashion to fully investigate these very much credible concerns. So Stockton Rush touted his relationships with NASA, Boeing, and the University of Washington. Of course, post-tragedy, they all clarified that their involvement was rather limited, and in many cases, Mr. Rush ignored their advice. This is again from the Marine Board of Investigation report. It talks about the Titan submersible that was involved in the implosion was an undocumented, unregistered, non-certified, unclassed, 22-foot manned commercial watercraft. The hull consisted of five inches of carbon fiber wound filament, which was comprised of five individual layers glued together. Mr. Rush also received a warning letter from the professional society uh, called Marine Technology Society. And their mission, as stated on their website, is inspiring and advancing innovative ideas for the sustainable use of our ocean. And you just read from this letter. This was dated March 27, 2018. It's addressed to Stockton Rush. Dear Stockton, this letter is sent on behalf of our industry members who have collectively expressed unanimous concern regarding the development of Titan and the planned Titanic expedition. Our apprehension is that the current experimental approach adopted by OceanGate could result in negative outcomes from minor to catastrophic that would have serious consequences for everyone in the industry. Well, they got that right, unfortunately. And, of course, those warnings went unheeded. And there was some speculation that Mr. Rush somehow had a death wish. And there was no real supporting evidence for that whatsoever. I think he's somebody who passionately believed in what he was doing. If you read between the lines, he was extremely arrogant and domineering. And that was to the detriment of himself and the four other passengers of that submersible that died in that implosion. And we see that theme in engineering practice on tragedy after tragedy. I'm reminded of the Florida International University pedestrian bridge collapse that killed six people in Florida. There were plenty of warning signs of distress cracking in this post-tension concrete bridge that went unheeded. And again, it was part of the culture where you had a very dominant engineer of record, and apparently, according to those ar around him involved with the project, they didn't feel empowered to bring up their concerns and, and actually be listened to, because, after all, he was the expert, and I'm referring to Denny Pate. But if you look at the NTSB report of this collapse, and you look at the analysis, you see a lot of similarities with the Ocean Gate. Titan implosion. You have design issues, you have people ignoring signs of structural distress, a lack of adequate independent peer review. This bridge was supposed to go through both preliminary and final design checks. If you read the probable cause statement from the NTSB report, it determines the probable cause of the Florida International University pedestrian bridge, pedestrian bridge collapse was the load and capacity calculation errors made by FIG Bridge Engineering Inc. Contributing to the collapse was the inadequate peer review performed by Lewis Berger, which failed to detect the calculation errors in the bridge design. And again, you have lack of adequate oversight by the Florida Department of Transportation in this situation. Earlier, I mentioned the Challenger disaster that killed all seven astronauts on board in 1986. And again, there were warnings about the O-ring seals on the solid rocket booster by the engineering company that, and manufacturer, Morton Thiokol, that went unheeded by NASA management. There was tremendous political and commercial pressure to get this shuttle launched, even though the temperatures were very cold and well below the recommended operating range for that seal on the solid rocket booster. In some ways, you know, the space shuttle was still in its experimental phase, for lack of a better term. The shuttle only had 24 successful missions prior to this 25th mission where Challenger exploded, and one of the astronauts was a civilian, a school teacher. I mean, NASA had no business putting a school teacher on a spacecraft that only had 24 successful missions. So again, that shows a complete lack of appreciation for the overall risk profile. And one final example here, there was a tragedy here in Kansas where I live 
in 2016 where a 10 year old boy was killed on a water slide. And this water slide was the tallest in the world at the time. I imagine it probably still would be. Water slide was 167 feet tall. And you had essentially an arms race in the amusement park world where people were trying to build the biggest, the most outrageous, the scariest rides out there. And the chief designer, and I use that term advisedly, is a man named Jeff Henry, and he's not an engineer. He's a person that had a lot of vision, had experience in the family business with water parks, and again, a very forceful personality. But you certainly had other engineers involved in this project. You had a lack of regulatory oversight, but yet it didn't result in people saying, hey, this is just insane. We can't do this. This isn't proper engineering practice. It's not safe for the public. There were plenty of warning signs. You know, multiple tests showed these rafts that could carry up to three people going airborne at the end of the slide. And to that end, they decided to install a netting system with a steel tube support. And it was this steel support where this young man was, was killed uh, when their raft flew up into the, the netting. So again, if you are an engineer, you have an obligation to not work in a company that has a toxic work culture. I mean, you just, you would regret it later on, I think, if something tragic happened and you were a part of a company where monetary decisions overruled good engineering practice. And uh, I actually quit a job one time when my boss forged my signature after modifying or essentially watering down an inspection report that I had done. This was back in the 1980s, and I found another job within a week. I wasn't going to work for somebody like that. So, again, there are many important and broad engineering lessons that can be learned from this Titan submersible tragedy, and I hope they are learned. But it seems like these events happen... People take note of it, and then in a few years, it's quickly forgotten, and it's business as usual. I hope that's not the case here. Well, with that, I want to send a shout-out to those of you who've contributed to buy me a coffee. That's one of the better ways to support this channel. I certainly want to also thank the channel members and those of you who've contributed super thanks. Again, additional ways to support this channel and what we do here. So please stay tuned for future videos, everyone.